Welcome to this episode of Profess Hers, a podcast about movies, music, history, pop culture, current events, and literature, all discussed through the perspective of women's issues and feminism. I'm Allegra, and I have a small cold, but uh, and that's why I might sound strange. I promise I'm not trying to do an Elizabeth Holmes impression. <laughs> I know that because of our topic today, it might seem like that's what I'm doing, but I'm not. And I'm Misty, and for once, I'm not the one that's sick. For once. <laughs> I'm always sick, and now it's not me. It's not Yay. you. And also, for the record, we are both women who are bosses of people. Yes. But I don't know that I would use the phrase lady boss. Would you ever use that to describe yourself? No. No? No. I'm trying to think of any situation. No. No. I, al- a- I also would not use girl boss. It's a weird word because sometimes it's used in the context of work and then sometimes it's used in the context of like a female empowerment rhetoric yeah like a like a powerful woman who's uh in charge of her life you know like it's the new hashtag lady boss yeah it's a new soccer mom like you're running your family's calendar and you're doing snacks for the whatever yeah like sometimes it's a work context and sometimes it's like boss of your own life context um It's a fun word, and, you know, there's a song from your favorite show. It's not from the show. Oh, really? Yeah, it's just from Rachel Bloom. Oh, okay. So there's a song from Rachel Bloom. That we've actually used before, by the way. Yeah, we used it on our very first episode, Lady Boss. Some women affectionately use it to describe their friends or other powerful women they know, and obviously we're not here to tell you that there's something wrong with using it, or that you should stop, or that it's a bad joke. I just think it's important to know how this word, like many, 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 many other words that we use and have fun with, are, is sometimes used in a more vicious, subversive way. Um, it can be used against us, right? Exactly. So when you use the term lady boss, most people think of a um, what you might call a type A, although I don't believe in type A, type B, but a type A self-motivated, tough lady, probably wearing tall heels, like Blake Lively's character in A Simple Favor, which I know Misty hasn't seen, and that's fine. Um, It's like a trope, right? A lady boss trope. I think the other thing to me that comes to mind is multi-level marketing. Yeah, you really want to talk about that. Well, I don't really want to talk about it, but I see hashtag lady boss in a bunch of because posts. They're, because they're business owners, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. our boss babe is the other one I see all the time. Ugh. I know. I right? don't like that one. Yeah. I'm not a fan. In the in the context of a workplace, the impulse to use the word lady boss is troubling because it insinuates that the word boss has a qualifier. Defaults to man. Yes. Right? So like the word boss usually means man. So if it's a woman who's the boss, I have to make sure and tell you it's a lady boss. Same as saying male nurse yes, or male nanny Mm -hmm. or man whore, right? Like the default word is gendered in people's minds. So, or even some people say lady doctor or lady cop, right? I think lady doctor means something completely different. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, (laughs) lady doctor could be a doctor for for ladies, but um, you're, you're right. Yeah, but I don't want the institution of bosshood... To be fundamentally male. Well, unfortunately for you, Allegra, statistically speaking, women make up 50.8% of the U.S. population, and we are currently receiving about 60% of all undergraduate degrees. Okay. Which sounds great, right? It does. 52% of all professional level jobs are now occupied by women. And then this is where it falls off a cliff. Okay. So 52% of professional jobs. Great. Awesome. 36% of first or mid-level managers are women. Okay. 25% of executive or senior level management is women. Not good. And only 6% of CEOs. That's awful. In addition to that, there has also been historically this aversion to having a female boss. Yeah, I was reading about that. And and I have informally been asking people, and most people don't want to answer the question. Oh, really? Yeah. If I say, would you rather work for a man or a woman? 
they'll say like, well, you know, I've had some pretty good bosses who are men and some good bosses who are women. And I'm like, I want you to just tell me what word popped into your head when I asked you. Did you think man or did you think woman? And if they'll answer, they all say man. But really? Of, yeah. Well, Gallup poll said last year. Obviously, that's a non-scientific informal poll of me asking five people I know. But yeah. So the Gallup poll that came out last year um, basically said for the first time ever, there's now not a statistically significant difference in people who prefer a male boss. So the gap is closing. Here's my question. Yes. What about for women? Okay. Isn't it more likely that a woman wants a male boss? It can be. But you know what the weird thing is? What? Women are also more likely to be paid higher by a male boss than a female boss. That's gross. Yeah. I don't know why. So one of the articles... For either of the reasons I could imagine, it's gross. It's either gross because the reward system is not merit-based, but based on something else, or it's gross because the female boss is hindering or holding someone back or creating some kind of sense of competition as opposed to some kind of support system. Um, Either way, it's gross. So one of the economic studies I read found that female bosses paid lower performing females less because having a low performing female on their team was a threat to them being seen as a good boss. Sure. So they were trying to... Well, I mean, but that's universally true. If you have a bad employee, it makes you look bad as a boss. Right. But having a female bad employee for a female boss okay, was ma- seen makes as, you look even worse. Because it made them feel like if I continue to have this person on my team, it looks like I'm supporting her just because she is a woman. Yeah. And so they had created in their mind all these incentives yeah. to try to get these women to leave their teams. And we're going to talk about that later, too, when we talk about tokenism, because there's a similar problem when we get into workplaces with women. Yes. So 6% of CEOs are female. You know what's really interesting, though? Because I found this, too. I think this was in The Atlantic. Once you have a female on the corporate board, then you're more likely to see executives that are female get hired and female CEOs get hired. I wonder why. I know. It's weird, right? It's this magic unicorn that nobody can explain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing about the term lady boss and the concept. We know, and social science research supports the statement, that the more representation and diversity you get in a workplace, the more it will breed representation and diversity. And not for diversity's sake, but because I mean, it's really merit-based because people really start thinking about who is the best person for the job and who best serves our company or our organization's interests. And even bottom line, studies have shown that the more diversity of all levels that you have at your company, the more profitable you are. When it's not an old boys club, then people aren't as secure in their jobs. And I don't want people to be insecure in their jobs, but I also don't want people to be so secure that they think, you know, oh, I play golf with Randy, so I could never get fired. With apologies to my coworker, Randy, who is wonderful. (laughs) Okay, so. In researching the term lady boss. Allegra stumbled upon uh, something amazing. A very unfortunate discovery, which is that there is a product called lady boss. Now, is it a product that helps inspire and empower future female leaders of tomorrow? I don't think so. Is it a product that helps us understand diversity and representation in the workplace? Again, I'm going to have to say I don't see that. It is a leadership program to mentor young women into growing into strong female bosses. No. What is it? It's a weight loss system. Oh, good. Which claims to have served 1.3 million worldwide. 1.3 million women. But it's just for women. Just women. And you can tell because their website is hot pink. Yes. And lots of before and after photos. Lots of, and we're going to put this in quotation marks, nutrition advice, right? Yes. And it's, what is it, like the skinny woman inside of you is waiting to come out <laughs> or some some nonsense of that nature? Your confident alter ego. Oh, okay. Because you, know, you can't be confident if you have extra weight. No. Obviously. Uh, when is it going to be your turn to look, feel, and be who you want to be? It's gross. So this person, their confident alter ego is someone who is in control of her destiny, her situation, her health, and her body. And you can't be fat in those things. No. Obviously. obviously. So the company was founded by Brandon and Kaylin Palin. 
in 2014, so it's a relatively new company. Both had previously worked at other weight loss companies. From what I can tell, it looks like they're based out of New Mexico. And he is the CEO of the company. Of course. Yes. I mean. Lady boss. Yeah. Why wouldn't a Brandon be in charge of that? (laughs) I mean, I just feel like even if it's just for the sake of visibility, why would you put a man in charge of a company called Lady Boss? I really don't know because she wrote a book. She's like the face of the company. She's the head trainer or whatever, and yet he's the CEO. But that's that's what the term has become, right? It's kind of a joke or uh, this is a way that it's used against you. So like if you want to be in charge of your own life, first you have to be skinny to do it. Obviously, whether um, it's it's just dumb. Well, the thing is, we're not against somebody losing weight or gaining weight or like we just don't think that it needs to come in a pink ribbon, right? Right. And it doesn't need to be packaged in the real you is trying to come out. Right. Or your confident alter ego is trying to emerge. It doesn't need to be packaged in we're going from wrongness to rightness, but rather like we're going from one weight to another because of based on your personal goals and interests. So this is the sentence right here. I found an interview that Brandon gave. And this is the sentence where it's just like nails on a chalkboard to me, okay? Can't wait. He's describing what the company is doing and like their mission. And he says, so we help women lose weight while loving themselves again. Oh. You know, it would have been fine if you hadn't have had that last word. Yeah, because... Again. It insinuates, A, you got fat because you stopped loving yourself. And B, you can't love yourself if you are fat. Exactly. Or not, I mean, even if you are just at not your ideal weight, I mean, or his ideal of what your weight should be, more likely. Exactly. But it's the way you put the again in there. You must hate yourself because look at you. Exactly. (laughs) So he talks about how the people that choose Lady Boss, they make a decision not to be a victim, to step into that mentality. A victim of what? And to become a Lady Boss. What? Exactly. He's he's canceled. I canceled him. <laughs> it was really frustrating to do some research here. Yeah, I was just trying to look up different meanings of the word. I didn't need to find all that, you know? You know, there was a small part of me that was like, oh, I hope this is a good company. Then when I got on the website and I started digging around for interviews, I was like, well, that's done. And it has a rating of D from the Better Business Bureau. Not only are they promoting negative body image stereotypes, and not only are they trying to get you to hate yourself, and not only are they a diet company, but it sounds like they're also ripping people off. There's a lot of complaints so far. So they're canceled. I've canceled them. (laughs) So I want to talk to you about tokenism. Okay. According to Slate, actually, according to a lot of people, the higher you look on almost any company's organizational chart, the fewer and fewer women you'll find. And that's something that you were telling us earlier with the statistics. Yes. And several studies in 2018 show that many women would prefer to have a male boss instead of a female boss. And that is a curious question for me. So I I think I understand why... A man would say, I'd rather have a male boss. I don't agree with any of the reasons, but it's very easy for me to understand latent misogyny, thinking that you can rise further faster if you are bros with the boss. I mean, I understand all of those. What you're used to. Sure. But I didn't understand. I could not for the life of me understand why if you just ask women, not not thinking of a specific person or boss, would you rather have a male or female boss? The longer a person, the longer a woman is in the workforce, the less likely she is to want a woman as a boss. That's interesting. So the longer you work, the more and more likely you are to say, I would rather not have a female boss. That I was interested in and that I did more research about. And so I want to talk to you about it. Okay, because, yeah, I would have thought it would have been the opposite. So there are a lot of notions and uh, people have a lot of experiences with female bosses who treat them poorly. Okay. And so The Atlantic actually did a whole series of videos about it. Some women disparage each other because they believe negative ideas about their own gender. So they have uh, internalized misogyny. Yeah, they have internalized negative stereotypes. It's actually a psychological concept called system justification. There are a few conditions that create these toxic attitudes. Some women disparage each other simply because they believe negative ideas about their own gender. 
System justification is a psychological concept in which oppressed groups struggle to make sense of an unfair world and internalize negative stereotypes. You can see this at play in a series of studies where researchers asked participants to pick teammates for a round of computerized Jeopardy. The players were given a choice between insecure and confident male and female partners, and there was a cash prize. The male participants had no preference between the confident man and the confident woman, but not a single female participant chose the confident woman over the confident man. But basically, if they look around and they see that women aren't higher up in the company, they think the reason is that women aren't capable or deserving. So they start to internalize misogyny and disparage other women, mistreat them, treat them poorly. Women working in male-dominated environments don't build solidarity or rapport with female co-workers because they're, you're mostly working around men. So you don't have the experience of building solidarity and rapport. The more women there are in a workplace, the more supportive of each other they are because they are less competitive. If it seems at your company or organization that there is only room for one or two women at the top or in positions of power, then female employees start to feel like they are competing with each other. So instead of saying, hey, and obviously this is subconscious. Right, exactly. And this is the effect of like generations of sexism and misogyny in the workplace. It's not the fault of the people who have these feelings. But instead of... Because they might not even realize they have them. Right. But the, the thought is not, we should overthrow the system and we should create a, and demand a system that is that is more balanced and representative of who works here. Instead of that... We say there are two positions of power for females and there are 20 of us, which means we have to compete with each other. To get one of the to two. To get into, so it's kind of like a narrowing of. A funnel. Yeah. And so you have to fight each other to get into those positions. That's called tokenism. This dynamic is known as tokenism. When there appear to be few opportunities for women, they begin to view their gender as an impediment. Feeling like a token can lead to another psychological phenomenon known as favoritism threat. Which means that if I am a female boss, even a mid-level boss, and I promote you or praise you, then As I another female. am going to seem like I'm biased toward women. Right. Which means I end up being tougher on women so that I am not perceived as biased in their favor. That makes sense. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, right? But, and so then a lot of times what happens is women start acting the way they see men acting as a way to get ahead. So when women, quote, act like men in the workplace, they behave the way they see their male counterparts working, they do and behave the way they see their male counterparts succeeding, they run into different problems than men do. I would think that it, with some of this, it's not women, quote unquote, wanting to act like men, but it's trying to act like a boss does. Right. So you're modeling their behavior. Right. But when you do what a man does, you get pushback that a man does not. Exactly. So women are expected to soften their language and their approach. They are expected to be in some ways maternal, more emotional, and just generally nicer. So when they do soften their approach, then they earn less respect because they're right. soft. Exactly. <laughs> Which means that they are put into a position to be harsh so that they're not soft. And once you're harsh, then you are you end up in a very likely to be mistreating your employees. So you have this endless cycle right. of I want to be taken seriously, but I have to be more empathetic. But if I'm empathetic, then I'm weak. So then I have to take something out on somebody so I'm seen as serious. And so then I'm treating people harshly and nobody wants to work for me. And what happens is you are put, the system has put female bosses in this endless loop of you can never ever succeed you're either too good or too bad but you're never right do you feel like this is going to get better no <laughs> okay i don't okay have you ever had a female boss allegra obviously before this job yes i had never had a female boss before this job well your only other job was at ymca that's not true I've worked at a lot of colleges. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. Before this specific job. Yeah. I've never had a female boss. Okay. And now being an apartment chair. Yeah. You are a female boss. I am a female boss. But I don't know how much of what I do is emulating men or if it's just I'm trying to act like the chairs that I liked. But they were all men. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I think this will eventually get better. If I had had a chair that was a woman, maybe I would have something to compare it to. So as more women enter fields and get promoted, I do think it's going to get better. Do you? I 
am hopeful that it will get better. Not for a long, long time. The path to success is way too narrow. And depending on the field, it, it's like impossibly narrow. So I want you to think about, and you're not an expert in technology or Silicon Valley companies. Nope. Okay. I want you to think about all of the technology companies you can. Okay. Can you think of any women in serious and public positions of power? I can think of a former one, but we're going to talk about her later. There's one. Yeah. There's exactly one, right? And her name is Sheryl Sandberg. Yes. And she works at Facebook. Yes. Do you know her? Not personally. She wrote a book. Oh, uh, you mean like, do I know of her? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Not do you know her? <laughs> yeah. Do you guys play golf on the weekends? Uh, yeah. So, you know Sheryl Sandberg, right? So, there are, there, to be fair, there are a few female executives in Silicon Valley and some fit former. So, Marissa Meyer was the former yes. head of Yahoo. And we're going to talk about Elizabeth Holmes in a minute. So Sheryl Sandberg is the COO of Facebook. Yes. In 2013, she wrote a book. Pretty famous book. And the thinking at the time was she's a very successful, because before she worked at Facebook, she worked at Google. Yes. So the thought was she is one of these rare unicorn female CEOs in the tech industry or female female executives in the tech industry. So she should have a lot of wisdom to share. Right. We want and she's going to tell us how we can all become her the unicorn. So she wrote a book. Unfortunately, it Called was a steaming pile of garbage, but that's fine. Um <laughs> Allegra has some strong opinions let me on this be, podcast. Let me be more objective. Is this because you have a cold or she do you wrote, really feel this way? She wrote a book. Yes called Lean In, Women Work and the Will to Lead. Now, before this book came out, to say you need to lean into something meant accept it, it was happening to you. Yeah. Right? Like, lean into... Discomfort. Right. Because you don't lean into things you want to do. You jump into those things. Exactly. So she described her book as a feminist manifesto. And it was a very popular book. Lots of people read it. Lots of people had book clubs about lots it. Lots of people talked about it. Lots of people talked about it. And the phrase became part of our vernacular. So now the phrase lean in refers mostly when people use it to women in the workplace. Yeah. It's kind of a social movement. And there are still like, they're not book clubs, but they're groups. They're lean in circles. And there are women who, <laughs> it's real, who, who read the book, who are inspired by the book, who want to live by the message in the book, and they meet, Does this, it's starting to sound like a cult, isn't it? They meet regularly to discuss and implement the guidance that Sheryl Sandberg puts forth in the book. It offers a look at the challenges that women face in the workforce. But basically, here's the message. It's a can-do attitude, all right? If a woman works hard enough and asserts herself enough, she can thrive at home and at work. So a lot of the headlines when Lean In was coming out and being popularized was you can have it all, right? If you work hard enough. And you can be a, a rock star mom and a rock star at work. While most of the other people in the world at this time in 2013 were saying it's really hard. Yeah. And sometimes you have to make decisions where you know I'm going to disappoint one person or another. I'm going to disappoint my coworkers or my family. I'm going to disappoint my students, my customers, my boss, or I'm going to disappoint my children. Right? There's like you only 24 hours in the day. You have to make tough decisions. What she was saying is you have to position yourself to be able to to have it all. And most of what she wrote, this was six or seven years ago, most of what she wrote, let's say it hasn't aged well. That's true. Because there are things that you cannot will yourself out of. There are institutional roadblocks that you cannot will yourself or work so hard that you can overcome. And to say, lean in, and to take these words as they are written kind of ignores all of those things. So you're either coming from a very privileged perspective, right? Which she was. or And or you are ignoring a lot of what is really happening to people in real workplaces. To be completely fair to her. Sure. She has, since 2016, mm -hmm. admitted that there are mistakes in Lean In and there were perspectives that she overlooked. Now, the primary one... Has she written a follow-up book called Lean Out? No, of course not. 
No, but I mean, she's given some um, speeches and she's given some interviews where she says that, yeah, I made mistakes and I was wrong. And one of the first things she said is that she didn't think about single moms. You wrote a whole book about working women and you forgot about single moms. Well, it never once entered your mind or you thought that seems complicated and it doesn't really fit with my lean in philosophy. So I'm just going to leave it out. I think more or less she was writing from her own perspective and she had never had that experience. So it didn't occur to her. But unfortunately, since then, she has had that experience. Her husband died. Well, that, but that's that's what motivated her to revisit her book. So that's horrible. And I'm sad it happened. It shouldn't have to happen to you for you to care about it. I agree with you. But I think at least she has the self-awareness to realize that she did make mistakes and that now she has a new perspective. It doesn't encourage women to reach out to and form alliances with other women in the workforce to tamp down the inclination to be competitive, to tear each other down, right? It seems like this is going to sound very strange and okay. I could be wrong, but it feels like a book that was written to support the current, the status quo, because she's not telling you to overthrow the system. Right. She's not saying we need a revolution. And to change the way businesses treat women. She's saying, here's how to very narrowly, very cleverly navigate this really terrible system so that you personally can be successful as opposed to here's how we need to change the American workplace so that all people can be successful or have an opportunity to be successful. And again, to be completely fair to her, she has come around to some of those things in recent years. But, but the lean in circles are still meeting and That's they're true. and this book is still being read. That's true. I think a follow up is needed, but I'm happy to have seen some acknowledgement of mistakes that are in this book. Or maybe not mistakes, maybe mistakes is too hard of a word. Um limited perspective. Yeah, I mean, I guess the easiest metaphor I could give you is it seems like She's telling you how to put a gas mask on so that you can successfully navigate a toxic environment as opposed to saying, hey, has it ever occurred to someone to make this place less toxic? Right. Yes. I don't know if that's a good analogy or not. But I would say now she is saying some of those things about how to make it less toxic. She's talked recently about family leave and about how the U.S. needs to join the rest of the developed world in offering paid maternity leave. So she's starting to have those conversations. Yeah. And I just don't think that should be completely discounted. So what, you're on Team Sheryl Sandberg now? I am on Team Accurate Historical Record. So Bell Hooks, you know who Bell Hooks is? I do know who Bell Hooks is. So Bell Hooks wrote a critical analysis of the book, and her analysis is called Dig Deep Beyond Lean In. And she basically says that Sheryl Sandberg comes across as a lovable younger sister who just wants to play on Big Brother's team. Here's the quote that from Bell Hooks that I really like. The concrete systemic obstacles most women face inside the workforce are being ignored by the book. And there are some women who don't have enough power because they are single moms, because they are people of color, because they are first generation college graduates, because if they lost this job, they would become homeless. There are plenty of women who can't afford to do a lot of the things that she recommends doing, and that kind of gets overlooked. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there is definitely a perspective of privilege in this book. And the reason I think it's important to talk about, because it inspired, I don't want, it's not a whole generation, but it inspired like a crop of women who were entering or working in, especially in Silicon Valley and in technology. It inspired them to follow in her footsteps. Because if you are also happen to be a white woman of privilege working in the same industry as her, this absolutely is a blueprint for success. So for those women in that situation, this book was, I don't know, not a Bible, but definitely a guidebook. A manual? Yes. So you know who I want to talk about now? Elizabeth Theranos. Okay, her name is not Elizabeth Theranos. <laughs> So let's talk about Elizabeth Holmes. All right. So Elizabeth Holmes is the other 
probably Silicon Valley female uh, executive that you were thinking of. Yes. And also, again, this is not me doing an impression of her voice, although it is true that I sound exactly like her right now. So people are probably aware of her because there was an HBO documentary. And a podcast. And a podcast. And a two-hour 2020 special. Okay, I didn't know about the 2020 special. Um, So her name has been floating around yes. for a while. Yeah. What is she famous for? Well, it depends on who you ask. So here's th- the first thing I want to say is there's a long history of tech startups faking it till they make it. Yes. Okay. And if you watch um, the show Silicon Valley, it's about a bunch of dumb, dorky dudes. Well, they're not dumb. They're really smart. But it's about a bunch of dorky dudes doing exactly that, right? They have a product. It doesn't really work yet. They get a bunch of investments. They fake it till they make it. They have all these problems. It's hilarity ensues. But also in listening to the podcast and watching the movie and doing more research about Elizabeth Holmes and her tech company, it's very obvious to me that this is that her strategy, her initial strategy is not uncommon. No, right. There are very there are some very notable things that set her apart, but that strategy is not uncommon. She's not the first person to take millions of dollars for something that doesn't work. Right. And you're Yet. hoping that your research and development will catch right. up. Right. Thinking if I take this million dollars, yes. then I can get it to work. Exactly. So um, she tapped into greed and hubris among mostly male, mostly white investors. So what exactly were they investing in? So she raised over $600 million initially, that's just at the initial raising of funds, to build a company called Theranos based on a fast, inexpensive, and comprehensive, which as you know, you probably can't get all three from anything, right? Fast, inexpensive, comprehensive. Blood test. Pick two. (laughs) That's the rule, right? Um But she was marketing the machine and the company that would provide a fast, cheap, comprehensive blood test that took only a finger prick of blood. So equivalent to what like a diabetic would use to test their blood sugar. So Um, rather than having to have the full... A venous blood draw. Yes. Which aren't fun. Which they're painful. They take a long time. And if especially if you're ill or older or... Anemic. Right. All of these reasons that it can be... And especially if you have illnesses where you have to get your blood tested once a week or once a month, right? So that's a lot to go through. So it was a very alluring promise. And it would have been miraculous if it worked, right? Because right, she'd be this celebrated wonderkin. And a lot of what she said at the very beginning was, I want to give people access to their own information. So she actually lobbied in Congress to allow people to order their own blood tests. So you don't have to wait for a doctor to order your own blood test. If you want to get your blood tested, you want to check your own levels, you can order your own blood test. So like all of that stuff, giving people access to information, knowing sooner uh, if you have a problem, looking for things like cancer far in advance, all of those things sound amazing. And none of it worked. She hid all of the flaws. She's just a strange person. Um, But these two things can be true at the same time. Elizabeth Holmes, founder of the failed medical testing company Theranos, probably lied to investors, seems like a terrible person, and deserves a long prison sentence. I think that's true. But I also think it's true that the coverage of her is ridiculous. What do you mean by the coverage? I mean, the way that media organizations, including The New Yorker, BuzzFeed, CNN, Nightline, Vanity Fair, that the coverage of her has been unbelievably... No, but do you mean before or after she was found out to be a fraud? In the last six months. Okay. Unbelievably sexist. Okay. So like what happens in the coverage is they talk about what she did for about two paragraphs and then for about three more pages, they talk about how weird she looks, her weird hair, her weird makeup, her weird voice. Her voice is real weird though. That needs a paragraph. I'm just like going to say that her needs a paragraph. physical attributes. Right. Which if she was a male would not even be discussed. And even the way she dressed, right? So everyone says, oh, it's funny. She's made herself dress like Steve Jobs because she wanted to become Steve Jobs. Well, Steve Jobs stole that outfit from a different tech executive in Japan because he wanted to be like that person. Right. Right. Like none of this is new. Vox said that she had questionable personal style. <laughs> Do you know how many male people in the technology industry have what I would call technical person or questionable personal style? Yahoo interviewed image consultants who speculated that she was trying to assert dominance through intense makeup. Okay. 
And just informally, if you look on Twitter, a lot of the things that people say about her have to do with her split ends, with her weird eyeshadow, with the way she dressed, with the way, I mean, just very very gendered and sexist. And it's not because of the outrageousness of the story. Because it's not just because of that. Think about the far the fire festival. Yes. Right? That guy was totally weird. Bizarre. Ripped people. Now obviously he didn't put people's lives in danger and I'm not saying that it's the same, but it is equally weird. Right. Right? Do you see very much news coverage about the way he dressed or did his hair? No. No. I mean, people, people like hired experts to talk about her, the way she does or doesn't blink. Like, who cares? We're talking about organizations that we respect as media enterprises who have whole pieces about her hair, her freaking hair. Although I do want to talk about her hair for a minute. (laughs) So she has blonde hair. Okay. And people are commenting on is that she dyes her hair, that she's bleaching her hair, right, to turn it blonde. Okay. Why does that matter? It doesn't, except only about 5% of white American women have naturally blonde hair. Okay. Okay. Nearly 50% of female chief executives are blonde. So you're saying that she was leaning in to a certain look that she felt like she needed to have as a CEO? Some publications have said to women, if you crave a leadership position you should dye your hair blonde. And the psychoanalyst who analyzed Holmes's appearance and said that she looks like she looks like a sociopath because that's something that you can diagnose by, by looking. looking at somebody. Yeah, that person's also blonde. I, I thought that was interesting, right? 5% of white women are blonde, 50% of female chief executives blonde, which number one means that most of the female chief executives are white and either you're getting promoted more if you're blonde or you're dyeing your hair blonde to get promoted, there is some correlation between success in business and being blonde if you're a woman. But we don't think it's causation. I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't have enough information to tell you whether it's causation or not. I'm going to say it's not causation. <clears throat> I mean, it could be. It could be that you are more visible to men because you are in more alignment with okay, their... Okay, but you're not saying blonde hair is inherently no, a superior no, hair color. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. But it could be that you are more visible to people who would promote you because you fit the very traditional model of white beauty. Yes. That's true. I do think that's possible. Okay. I don't think it's possible that blonde hair makes you better at your job. Smarter. Yeah. Blonde hair makes you smarter. It also doesn't make you dumber, just to clarify. Well, right, yeah. Just... <laughs> I wasn't so, saying that. So... The other thing about Elizabeth Holmes is she is surrounded by or was surrounded by a whole host of very powerful, very rich men who supported, promoted and invested in her. And that includes Bill Clinton, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, George Shultz, Henry Kissinger, Errol Morris, Stanford professors, Apple employees. Like we can't say who knew what when, obviously. I don't think that when Bill Clinton interviewed her and said that our next generation is going to be just fine based on her as a model. I Obviously, I don't think he knew what she was doing. Yes. But obviously. at the same time, George Schultz and Henry Kissinger didn't really investigate the authenticity of what she was doing. And many of these male investors openly admit that her physical appearance contributed to their willingness to give her money. And when you hear these stories and you think she got millions or billions of dollars for something that never worked and couldn't have worked, but there are lots of people who are less traditionally attractive, less white, right, who can't get their startup off the ground. Right. So the only women, the only women who can get all this venture capital and make all this success for themselves are probably going to look very similar to her. Right. Because there's barriers to other women. Yeah. And what we say is that she cast a spell over them and that these men were victims. No. Exactly. But that no. but, but that is 100%, well not 100%, but that is a very big part of the story is that she cast a spell over them and that they had no culpability whatsoever. You know how we know that's not true? Tell me. You've watched the documentary? Mm-hmm. So in the documentary, they go and interview one of her early professors at Stanford, Dr. Phyllis Gardner. Yes. And immediately she tells her, due to the laws of physics, your idea will not work. Well, she tells her that about the patch. 
Um, but then she says, your other thing probably can never work. Right. So this spell that was cast. Oh, yeah, exactly. Is only on men? Uh-huh. Okay. The good, good. So she's a witch. That's where we're going with this. And here's the other thing that, that, that is surprising to me is Phyllis Gardner, Dr. Phyllis Gardner, yes. the Stanford professor who is in the documentary. She's also interviewed in the podcast, The Dropout. Yes. She is actually a genius yes. in the, in the pharmaceutical technology industry. She has actually invented things that have revolutionized healthcare. But there are no podcasts or documentaries about her. And the only reason anyone bothered to talk to her is because she had some interaction with Elizabeth Holmes. Exactly. Now, I know we're, I'm not here. I'm not trying to change the, the world. I'm not saying we should stop listening to the most salacious stories. But, like, maybe we should listen to the people who know what they're talking about. Trust experts. Maybe. She's older. So anyway, they make somebody makes the point in in the podcast that Phyllis Gardner is actually a healthcare and technology inventor and she really has revolutionized things. Yes. And the focus is never on her. And obviously the media, podcasts, HBO documentaries, they're gonna be about the most salacious, ridiculous, crazy story. That's the story that attracts attention. I mean, that's the story that attracts my attention. Exactly. Am I gonna watch a documentary about ridiculous Theranos disaster, 100%. Am I going to watch a documentary about the woman who invented time-release capsules? Uh, Maybe not, right? I understand that. I would watch that. You would. I understand that. But I also think when we're giving millions of dollars to someone like Elizabeth Holmes... The onus is on you to do a little bit more research. And if there is a woman standing here saying, I know all of this stuff about science and technology. I am a professor. I am a doctor. I am her teacher. We're not listening to those women. Yes. Because we're listening to the flashy, splashy, most attractive, right? Like the the decisions that George Schultz and Henry Kissinger made were not 100% based on Science. Science or finance. Exactly. I mean, one of them said, you know, I wasn't sure. She was young. She didn't have that much training. But someone in her family is an entrepreneur and someone else in her family was a doctor. So it was in her genes. What? That's how you get those My dad is a city traffic engineer and I can't add two numbers together. (laughs) Like, that doesn't make any sense. So it's just gross. It's also disappointing. You know who else gave her a lot of money? Who? Rupert Murdoch. Oh, that makes sense. Millions of dollars, even after evidence emerged that would have given them doubt. Kissinger, Henry Kissinger. Yes. You know him. Yeah, I do. He was on the board, and you can see him in the documentary, like, not able to operate his computer. (laughs) George Schultz, a retired diplomat. He basically adopted her and defended her against his own grandson. His grandson was the whistleblower. That's right. You've seen, I mean, if you've seen the movie. Well, I listened to the podcast. But they're all like asleep during the crime. So we're going to forgive them. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to make them completely not culpable for this at all. Is that what you're trying to say? Like, we're we're letting them off the hook. And, And so here's the thing about Elizabeth Holmes. She did all of the things that women are urged to do all of the time, right? Go blonde. Yes. Wear makeup. Act like a man or talk like a man. A a specific man in this case. She is assumed to have done all of those things maliciously, but she's just leaning in, man. I mean, yes and no. What? At a certain point, doesn't it become malicious? Well, so what she did... I mean, when people are getting bad test results. No, what she did with, with the business and the and the blood tests is malicious. But then we are saying the blonde hair and the smoky oh, okay. eye I, I see what you're saying. and the deep voice are malicious. She did those because that is literally how re- you get codified as yes. the path to success. Okay, sorry. I, I misunderstood I'm 100%. What you're I mean, like there are people who were told they did or didn't have cancer based on a blood test that was fake. Right. That's that's unforgivable, inexcusable. Missy's throwing stuff. Okay, so the other thing that's really disappointing about this story, though, is that you had a chance here for a young woman in Silicon Valley mm-hmm. 
to really break new ground. Yeah. And this would have been an amazing success story. Yeah. And so it's really disappointing that now when people think young women in Silicon Valley, this is going to be the first thing that pops into their mind. And I have no doubt that there is going to be another young woman in Silicon Valley that's going to invent something that's going to change the world. And this image will eventually be replaced. But she, but but, but the next five are going to be compared to Elizabeth Holmes. Exactly. That's the problem. Yeah. And the other thing is the system in which this happened was designed for this to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the system is set up so that a woman who acts and looks the way that she did could succeed initially and get a lot of money and that the technology industry is set up so that you can fake it till you make it and private companies don't have to disclose what they're doing or how they're operating. Like the system is set up for this to have happened. Right. So this is a spectacular failure of the institutions. Yes. As well as her. Yes. She she is one hundred percent culpable. I'm not saying she's blameless at all. But we I don't know. We can't be that surprised that something like this happened because people are investing all the time in technology that doesn't work. Exactly. We've had a lot of negative things to say in this episode. <laughs> So I did want to I, I did want to say eleven percent of all Silicon Valley executives are women, and that's as, as of two thousand fourteen. Eleven percent, and so there is a I would say right headed urge to get more women into the industry, but I don't know that leaning in is the way that you really p- become successful, and I don't know what the racial cultural breakdown of the 11 percent is right but i would venture to say it's probably majority white it's probably not representative i mean there's no way 11 percent is just too small if we are earning half of or more than half of the college degrees then there are plenty of women who can do these jobs and i don't think anybody is arguing that we should just give women jobs because they're women for the sake of it yes but there have to be women who can do these jobs So you're just, it's not a priority. It's not intentional to bring women into technology. And because there are no female bosses and because the path to success is very narrow in Silicon Valley, if you are a woman, then we're going to get back into all these lady boss tokenism problems that we were talking about, right? Where you're pitting them against each other, where they feel a sense of competition, where they don't have an environment where they can build camaraderie and where female bosses don't want to go too easy on their female employees or be perceived as playing favorites. Or get stuck in that cycle. Or get stuck in the cycle of you have to soften your approach so you're not a B word, but you have to toughen your approach so that you're not soft. And then you're just endlessly looping through that. You're right. This is just very negative. I don't know. I I have no solution for it. I feel like these things bubble up slowly. So we've seen women move into college education. We have now seen women cross the 50% line and getting more than 50% of the undergraduate degrees. I'm sorry. And then I think you're going to start to see those women make headway in mid-level leadership and then higher level leadership. I think this is a problem that will be solved. I really do. I just think it's a it won't be solved on the timetable we want it to be. The more women you have move into mid-level management – the more unremarkable it will be that you have a female boss. Like our boss, I never think of her as a female boss. She's just our boss. Right. And I think that is going to become the norm for the generation after us. I hope it becomes the norm for the generation after us. Well, but the, so the problem is, and so um, you watch the Theranos documentary, right? I watched the HBO one. That's the only one there is. Okay, then yes. So (laughs) do you remember Erica Chung? Yes. One of the whistleblowers? Yes. And she said, this is a quote, I idolized her for being a woman in the sciences, for being a woman in technology, the fact that she started her own company, that got me really excited. She was a really good idol to have. Because on the surface, you're like, great, I have a role model, someone who can show me how to navigate the world of science and technology and management and business and entrepreneurship. But she actually ended up having to become a whistleblower 
threatened, like physically threatened for telling the truth. So we have to find a way to elevate people like Erica. Yes. Based on their integrity and also their skill. I mean, she's, she herself is a woman in science and technology. Yes. She herself has job skills. She herself can be a role model. We have to, we have to systematically find a way for people like her to rise to the top so that we are not just automatically or giving an express pass to women who look like and sound like Elizabeth Holmes. Because it's, I mean, even if Theranos is never going to happen again, right? the narrow path is still there. And it's still mostly for people who look and act and sound a certain way. Yes. But I, I have hope that eventually things will change. What we need desperately is diverse perspectives and representation. And diverse in all regards we need more than one yeah you can't have the girl at the we, table right we need more than one tech startup yes led by a woman so that the next five aren't compared to that one woman yes we also need more women in places like public office executive leadership roles we need more women doing the hiring and hr work in organizations yes right yes absolutely we need to move away from this you can have it all if you can do it all mindset that we got from Lean In to you can choose what you want to have. You can choose what you want to do. You as a person, as a woman, can choose to balance your family and your career. You can choose to focus on your career. You can choose to have kids or not. You can choose what your priorities are, and still be successful. You don't have to be some kind of superhuman, never resting, drive yourself crazy in order to have it all, do it all, be it all. Yes, I agree with that. And we have to have some balance for off the clock work, right? Domestic work. So who takes care of things in households? Okay, got it. You thought I said I was saying more men needed to be professional maids? (laughs) No, I I thought you were somehow saying like we need to be compensated monetarily no, for that. I no, was no, like, no. How, we just need to balance that work? the workload off the clock. And I don't just mean doing the dishes. I also mean like the emotional labor yeah. of being a family member who worries about things, who takes care of things, who makes sure things happen, who plans the kids' birthday who's party, planning things, right? All of those things have to be balanced, not just among genders, but also among ages, right? We can't put it all on the grandma of the family to be, you know what I mean? Like we have to have some balance in off the clock work if we want to see more balance in the workplace. Because if we are still socially expecting women to do the majority of things in and around the house and for the family, then it will be much harder to see more women in the workplace succeeding. Yes, absolutely. And we also have to have intentional leadership. What do you mean by that? I mean, we have to have leaders who, for whom representation is a priority. We have to have leaders who are conscious of the way they treat their employees. Yes. Who are thoughtful about whether they are treating or mistreating someone based on their gender, based on their family status, right? And- Obviously, sex discrimination is not the only kind of discrimination in the workplace. Of course not, no. Right? And so we need leaders who are thoughtful about the way they treat, respond to, and hire people who work for them. Exactly. Now, I don't know how you get those people to be intentional. I can tell you that sending them to leadership seminars... Is not enough. ...and having them read books about it does not change their paradigm. And there's a lot of social science research about how we change unconscious bias because it's very hard to do and you don't do it at an HR seminar. No. You don't do it at a weekend workshop. I mean, it's intentional emotional work that you do over a long period of time, but I can tell you that the more experience you have with people who are women or people who are young or people who are veterans, the more experience you have with people, the less likely you are to be unfairly biased against them. Yes, 
Absolutely. Which means if we had more representation, it would be easier to get more representation. So that's a chicken egg problem. Well, yeah. (laughs) Yes, it is. I've got nothing. You've got nothing? I can't fix that one. You're supposed to bring hope to our generation. (laughs) That is a lot to ask. Hey, Misty. Yes. You sounded hesitant. I uh, missed my page here. But go ahead. What's next in your lady life? So next in my lady life is preparing for our next episode, which I'm super excited about. You should be. I'm so excited. Why? Because we're going to talk about the stuff that we are fangirls for. We are. And we're also going to talk about the word fangirl. But uh, so you're going to study some, yes. some crazy ex-girlfriend? I am. You're going to so excited. watch Nazi span for I a while? I have a captivated audience to talk about how much I love this show, too. It'll be great because there has been a lot of coverage of the show. It just ended. It just ended. And there has been a lot of discussion um, about its impact and importance. What's your fangirl thing? Grey's Anatomy, of course. Of course. And I will be happily studying. <laughs> and and the very first thing I'm going to tell uh, tell everyone on our next episode is my estimation of how many hours of my life I have spent watching Grey's Anatomy. I spent some time <laughs> with my husband doing, doing the math. Doing the math. And I think I know. Oh, I'm excited pretty for this. Pretty close. So uh, I guess... That's our cliffhanger. Next time, find out how many hours of my life I have spent watching Grey's Anatomy. Find out if a legger can do math. (laughs) (laughs) That should be your tag. Thank you for listening to this episode of Profess Hearse, our podcast about seeing movies, culture, and history through our lady eyes. I'm Misty, and I'm a boss, but not bossy. And I'm Allegra. I'm a supervisor of employees who happens to be a female. We'd love to hear from you what you thought about today's episode, what you'd like us to discuss in future episodes, or how great you think we are. Which is extremely great. To connect with us, you can follow us on Twitter at ProfessHers, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-H-E-R-S, or by email, same address, ProfessHers at gmail.com. Thank you to everyone who has been listening, commenting, liking, and reviewing our podcast. Please keep doing all those things, and we hope you recommend our podcast to a friend, coworker, boss, or employee. And remember, let's lean on each other and not in.